everybody. This is Ethan Duke. Um, <clears throat> he spent four years in the service of our country as a member of the U.S. Air Force that took him overseas. While overseas, <clears throat> he began bird watching in earnest. Upon returning to the States, Ethan earned his bachelor's degree in wildlife management in 2006 from the State University of New York at Cobbleskill. During these and the following years, he also gained invaluable knowledge for his work at Missouri River Bird Observatory, extensive experience in research and monitoring of several avian species, including the pileated woodpeckers, various cerulean warblers, American red starts, wild turkeys, and grassland birds was gained across the United States. His years of experience gathering data for universities as well as state and federal agencies for conservation programs became an important feature in the founding of the Missouri River Bird Observatory. One of Ethan's fortes is avian vocal communications, or more simply put, bird songs. He willingly shares his thoughts on this. There is something about listening to a bird sing that I will never grow tired of. Birds are such an enjoyable medium through which the Missouri River Bird Observatory can connect with people, and this enables us to employ a seamless integration of research, education, and conservation. And with that, I turn it over to Ethan. Thank you for the introductions, Chad. Um, thank you all for uh, giving me this opportunity to speak. I'm going to fire up my presentation now. It's going to take just a second because I do the... Um, uh, uh, advanced thing where you can do a portion of your screen so you can look at your slide notes. So that's a good tech tip for people. Uh, um, let's see here. Stretch my window out here and I did a blank thing so nobody could even see my notes and sheet. There we go. Everybody see a good blank screen there? <clears throat> How about yes. now? There we go. You got your first slide. Good deal. Let me get these windows out of the way. Um, is there any boxes coming up in the way there? No. <clears throat> okay, good. Unpedal Olga gun. That's the language of the people of the Iroquois Confederacy. It means I have something to say. And I was born and raised in lands that were stolen from them. And that culture provided federalist and democratic frameworks of society and governance that our forefathers adopted from them. What I had to say is this. We keep doing the same things and expect a different outcome. Well, the electronic venue is a good example of how things have changed. We cannot keep going through the same motions or the same rituals in our conservation community. It isn't working. The drivers of bird declines are systemic, and we need to understand those systems, engage with our communities, and affect that change. This means harnessing the strengths of our traditional collaborations and organizations, such as this one, using modern tools at our disposal, and communicating to larger audiences. This uh, image here is uh, 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 the belt worn by Chief Hiawatha, um, who is one of those individuals that was uh, really uh, instrumental in, in helping our forefathers uh, frame our, our modern form of governance. Well, we, we, we've seen this, uh, uh, news of bird declines. Uh, this this paper and uh, this image in particular uh, should be burned in the minds of all of us conservationists. Rosenberg et al.'s paper uh, moved us all so much as, as uh, you know, it, it kind of was uh, launched at a conference and then uh, really taken up by uh, NABSI, you know, of which MOBSI is a microcosm of so we are clear on this concept and uh, we need to become more clear on the messaging. We're not clear on it is exactly how must this change? How, how can we be more effective in this change? So uh, clearly we, have, we haven't been doing it. You know, what we've been doing hasn't been cutting it. But uh, if, if those of you that maybe missed the keynote, 
um, about the staggering decline in bird populations, here's a couple of the highlights. Um, uh, we've seen these great population change in North America and throughout the world. And, and I've been tasked today to focus on grassland birds. Um, as you can see, of all these great steep declines, grassland birds are definitely in the biggest trouble. I, I mean, our keynote speaker drew attention to this. Uh, we've known the drops in the numbers here in Missouri were inevitable after we lost so much, all but less than 1% of our native grasslands. So yeah, um, just a little closer look there at the uh, proportion of uh, grassland declines and, and the proportion of it being within that, that group of grassland birds. So all that data was really great regionally collected data using a variety of means, but we at Merville collect a wealth of data on our own and a finer scale than the regional data uh, presented previously uh, is from. Um, our, our, I'll mostly just focus on our grassland uh, breeding bird surveys and, and mention a little bit more about that. Um, you know, we, we collect our data using mobile devices in the field and we spatially explicit every single bird detection uh, during line transect distance sampling. And this is, this is good for traditional outpits. I'll be a, a little bit more data with less time and uh, than through traditional methods. It results in yearly density fluctuations on species by species and a site by site basis. We try to make sense of that data for the public and stakeholders in a concrete way with, with metrics. But I mean, we have just piles and piles and piles of this type of data for every species of, uh, um, of concern. We, we do this kind of density analysis on, um, and uh, actually we just hired a new person to do further uh, uh, biostats with our, with our data sets, current data sets. But with this, uh, we, we do some math because we need to be able to communicate these things. So we helped develop this bird friendliness index, um, which is based on species conservation value scores. These are kind of old numbers I'm throwing at you. Our, our numbers for their ranks have actually changed quite a bit thanks to um, a lot of regional and local expertise. Uh, based on partners and flight scores, we actually adjusted our conservation value scores uh, based on, you know, strictly Missouri. Um, but we take those conservation value scores for each bird, you know, weighing its, its threats on its wintering grounds, um, population trends that are known, factors such as that. Then we multiply that by the densities that we find on each site. And then we throw in a diversity metric. And for the methods that we use to collect data, the most appropriate one is the Brulean. And so then we end up with uh, a conservation value score uh, cumulative for a property. And then we will combine those with uh, the best site in those regions and uh, figure out kind of a percentage rank um, and give it a real good uh, uh, end ending metric. We also have other outputs. Um, since all of our data is mapped, we can, we can provide a lot of different types of maps. Um, that includes um, maps that can show um, change in time. This is like Henslow sparrows over a few years and how they shift. And oftentimes those shifts come in a direct result of management actions. And that one went a little fast for you, I know, but basically you can see that if you, do a prescribed burn one year, the birds will shift around that property. This particular um, temporal map is during our migration surveys, and we can see the movement of Henslow sparrows and how they use the habitat over time. So we can look at things you know, spatially as, as well as temporally. Well, let's just start taking a look at some of the raw numbers. Uh, what we see in Missouri's best habitats. I mean, we primarily survey the best habitats in the state. <clears throat> state managed lands, NGO lands like the Missouri Prairie Foundations, private ranch land, which Chris Wilson will be talking about later, um, 
Just in breeding season alone, we've collected data on 216 species using the grasslands, you know, totaling over 140,000 individuals. Of our grassland obligate species, we've documented over um, 78,000 individuals. And this is just during one round of, of uh, grassland breeding season surveys. This is not counting the migration stuff or our subsequent rounds. We also monitored avian productivity and survivorship, um, you know, and, and uh, have a nest monitoring project going on in the upper Osage in conjunction with the MDC's long-term patch burn grazing study, but um, simply too much data and results to present in 20 minutes. But um, if we look at this data right here, just kind of our, our raw grassland obligate species detected, you can obviously see that you know the, the dick sissels are the most ubiquitous, while the prairie chickens and shrikes continue to be the least commonly encountered. Our surveys are designed and analyzed to produce those density estimates I was talking about. So I'll show you a little bit of those. Since it, our poster child here seems to be the Eastern Meadowlark, I'll bring that one up. Um, I'm not sure when our data set technically becomes a long-term data set, but we're beginning to see yearly fluctuations and unfortunately continued declines of some of the species even though we survey those best managed grasslands in Missouri. Um, what, if you just look at this few select sites, I, I threw out the uh, private lands that we survey within this priorities geography, the upper Osage, but you can see Monogar Prairie, Taborville Prairie and Wakanta. Uh, they, they are, we're, we're seeing these same kind of trends across the board. Um, not only with our primary poster child, but uh, with the grasshopper sparrow as well. Uh, grass, grasshopper similar, similar in, ge in the similarly declining in the geography of the Grand River grasslands. Um, continued decline since 2013, um, pretty much meshed with that data from Rosenberg et al. And uh, these great sites in the Grand River gra grasslands. I mean, it's just, it's kind of sad to see it, um, but you can see it here in these numbers. But since we collect our data in that spatially explicit way, I'll show you a series of maps, uh, years. Um, we kind of rotate through our site, so they kind of skip years, but here's what we've been seeing on the ground since 2013 at Dunn Ranch. Now that 2019, we didn't survey the bottom half. So don't let that fool you, but still you can see the difference over time. So we at Marbo began looking at land conversion with its specific grassland geographies. Back in 2015 is when we started to crunch numbers on it. It's a problem for grassland birds, obviously. Some species may be impacted differently by surrounding landscapes and at different scales, but they're all impacted by land use. Industrial row crop agriculture is considered in literature as a hostile landscape for grassland birds of greatest concern. In the UOG alone, the upper Osage grasslands, um, here's, here's the grass and pasture loss just in recent years, up to 2018. Um, and that's continued. As mentioned during the keynote, um, this it has many drivers behind it, causes of it, including, you know, the, the ethanol craze and, uh, you know, the whole um, idea surrounding the re renewable fuel standards. Um, this is a strong, compelling argument in that, that debate. Um, how how is this grassland being lost and how is it converting is pretty obvious. So just in this one priority geography of grasslands in the state, we've lost over 20,000 acres since 20, 2007. And it's been directly correlated with the increase in corn and soy production. That's just a fact. What's driving that? Well, here's the commodity and subsidies in Missouri, totaled 8 billion in recent years. Look at that jump in 2019. Obviously that's not good business. 
it's a failed system. It's hard. It's, 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 it's hurting farmers and it's hurting our environment. I'm going to transition here a little bit about things that you can do because it seems a little bit daunting. And this is part of this conference. But what you can do about these declines and a little bit about what Mirbo does about the actions mentioned in this conference. These actions address some of the greatest causes of declines by design. So it, it, it can work. Hopefully uh, you leave this conference understanding the urgency of these bird declines. You know, the science is clear and you know the steps. So, I, I mean, I can't go through all these and it's, it's for later in the conference, but I did want to mention that, uh, you know, uh, I, I will be, my, my co-director will be presenting on uh, bird safe later and window collisions later, but she's also working on advocacy and actions around plastics in conjunction with uh, the uh, Missouri River release big muddy clean sweep, Merbo will be conducting a uh, plastic brand audit. What's that you ask? It's brand audits where volunteers sample trash and litter uh, cleanup and collect spe specific data on producer material and quantity of single use plastic items. We'll use the Break Free from Plastics brand audit toolkit, and uh, we're gonna have a whole webinar. Hopefully Paige has put the link to the chat on the webinar for that and how people can get involved. Um, this is one area that's a good example of better understanding these systems. Um, as the petrochemical industry shifts towards scaling up its plastic production, we need to be able to communicate the impacts on conservation. So how well do we know this no policy advocacy, us as individuals. I mean, we've had great success with raptor conservation and waterfowl. Many of the boots on the ground for waterfowl were those in the hunting community. And many working for raptor conservation were from both the consumptive and non-consumptive end. Both successes were a result though from policies that were a catalyst for funding mechanisms as well as common sense regulations. If we don't address the policy and choose good policy makers, then there's little hope. Simply put, examine closely the policies of the national, state, and local levels. Every year, the Missouri legislature attempts to affect uh, our design for conservation. Every year, the legislature moves towards actions that can affect local control of environmental protections. We must address this on a local and state levels in a collaborative, nonpartisan way with science and common sense. This example here at plastics, you can see the impact, not only direct impact, but the systemic impact leading towards the impact on bird populations, uh, our grassland habitat, obviously more CO2 in the air, so making these broadleaves expand, making it harder to manage prairies. There's a lot of things that are, are systemic here, but we need to address it directly through policy. I just want to have big thanks to our Merbo supporters and our many partners and the funders of our grassland work. Uh, the MDC and the Bobolink Foundation continue to be excellent partners. I really want to give a big shout out to our field crew leader, Eric Ost, who has been our field crew leader over the last few years and done the hard work of wrangling crews, logistics, and many other tasks. It's, he's hurting a lot of cats, and it's not easy to do. Um, and also I wanna thank our people in the conservation community. I mean, there's many people here that I, I dearly love, but they still refuse to change their lifestyles and don't get involved with advocacy. You know, um, some just seeking to get their bird on until the clock runs out. Well, the science is clear and we need to break the stigma of inconvenience somehow. Every little thing you do makes a difference. Planting a native plant, window treatments, even food sourcing. Don't discount the impact to, e to even to people, just individuals can make for just a few birds. However, don't let others feel as though the onus of repair is all upon individuals. The requisite change that science so clearly spells out comes through inconvenience of learning about how our systems are flawed and that we must actively engage in any way people can to also change the culture of greed, consumerism, and selfishness that we see today. We need to double down on our innermost values. Those aren't the values we see 
garnering all the attention on the internet or political talking points, the values we share are nonpartisan and deep. They aren't triggering or controversial. If pe people's ethos don't benefit birds, clean air, water and soils, then how do we expect anything but negative consequences? If we fail to act on those values, then we are truly faithless. Now is the time, the science is clear, our health, hearts and souls are connected to the shared world with birds. Only you know the best ways you can affect change. It's time to act. Thank you. Thank you, Ethan. <clears throat> that was good. Um, I know for me, I'm always, even though I've seen those numbers several times, I'm always floored about how big they actually are on it. So, and we're gonna jump right into our next presentation. So with that, I'd like to welcome Doreen Mingle, who recently retired from the Missouri Department of Conservation after 31 years of service as, as an area manager, 20 years in the wildlife division, and 11 as a wetland ecologist with the resource science division. Doreen was also fortunate enough to serve as Missouri's representative on the Mississippi Flyway Council of Non-Game Bird Technical Section for 11 years. And part of her involvement with the Flyway had an opportunity to participate in the development of a conservation initiative that aims to identify species or specific threats and potential conservation actions to slow or reverse the declines of shorebird populations associated with the interior portions of North America, South America, and the West Gulf Coast of Mexico. This initiative will be the subject of her presentation today. So please take it away, Doreen. Thanks, Chad, appreciate that. Uh, can you hear me okay? I just got the dreaded, your internet connection is unstable. So if I happen to blip away, I'll <laughs> I'll be right back. Well, you um, sound so, good now. All right, great. So yeah, um, my goal today is to introduce you all to the Mid-Continent Shorebird Conservation Initiative, kind of talk about how and why it came to be, the steps we've taken to begin developing it and our, our next steps. But before I get into the nuts and bolts of the initiative, I just thought I'd kind of set the playing field on the, on the really um, incredible critters that, that we're focused on. So shorebirds, there's about 222 species worldwide, 82 in the Western Hemisphere, and 75 identifiable North American populations. And the characteristics of these um, critters is partly what makes them so susceptible and vulnerable to population declines. They're birds of open landscapes. We often associate them with the shoreline of coastal areas, but they're also associated with open grasslands. Uh, estuaries and, and freshwater wetlands. They have low productivity. Oftentimes there's only four eggs to a nest. Um, and then the survival of egg or chicks can be as low as less than 20%. So high adult survival is really key to population persistence, which makes this a really critical life history stage. And then they generally have small populations to begin with for the 75 North American populations, 31% have less than 25,000 birds, 65% are estimated about 20, 250,000 birds, and only 11 have more than a million birds estimated in their population. They breed at high altitudes with 71% of the populations nesting in the boreal and Arctic regions. So this is a very highly productive region for a short period since it has such a compressed growing season. So it's kind of a case of almost making that trade-off between very high reward while facing very high risk. And then as a result of that, they, they migrate very large distances. So they're one of the most um, mobile migratory groups of animals on the planet. And they travel thousands of miles between their Arctic nesting areas and the wintering grounds in South America. And so now that brings us kind of to the focus of the of the portion of shorebirds that that we're concentrating on. And those are the ones that use the mid continent portions of both North America and South America. And these areas, these geographies provide really critical habitat for the 14 to 16 million uh, North American migrants that move through the, the continents annually. And that doesn't really count the the birds that stay in, and breed within North America. And as a result of the fact that they travel such long distances, they're susceptible to multiple threats along the way, which can include um, habitat destruction due to urbanization, increased agricultural intensification, which includes increased pesticide loads, 
and enhance wetland drainage that may degrade habitats that they use. There's also a number of disturbances that they encounter. And oftentimes those are related to, to human uses. Um, it could be something like hiking, fishing, or even walking unleashed dogs. One of the primary threats that they discovered on the East Coast was the fact that unleashed dogs often scared adults off of nests, which um, made the eggs susceptible to, um, to, to not being able to finish uh, throughout. And, and so um, I'll talk about it here in a little bit, but that's one of the really cool threats that have been addressed through the initiative that developed along the Atlantic Flyway. And then of course, any climate related changes just intensifies these stresses. Because of the way that um, shorebirds are, are, have high site fidelity and tend to use the same staging areas and stopover areas year after year, degradation of one site can, can unravel a population. So, you know, a really primary question is how do we go about conserving some of life's most mobile species? And our, our approach has been the development of this Mid-Continent Shorebird Conservation Initiative. The interior portions of North and South America provide critical shorebird habitat, and yet we don't really have a comprehensive strategic framework for, core, for shorebird conservation. And the importance, you know, a lot of times you think, well, you know, a plan, we've always planned, what good is a plan? Well, where I think the importance of this plan is that it's, it's being developed at the scale of the, what the birds use. So it, it covers from the boreal, breeding areas down to the very tip of South America and is provides an overall umbrella of what are the threats that are, are um, that are causing or contributing to declines in these populations. And then as you have agencies or NGOs or other people who are interested in supporting shorebird conservation, this framework can provide the, the opportunities for them to, to provide support in a way, in a manner that's efficient and actually beneficial for the species. And so it's a collaborative approach. We've put together partners from across the range of those species. And then it's integrated that, that we're looking at the breeding grounds, the stopover areas and the overwintering areas and how best can we address the threats in each of those portions of the bird's life to, to support their their ability to complete their life history and annual cycle. So as I mentioned briefly, there, there have been other shorebird initiatives. The first one was the Atlantic Flyway Shorebird Initiative that came out in 2013. It was followed a couple of years later by the Pacific Shorebird Initiative. And so that left this gap in, uh, in the mid-continent, which is, is where our focus is. And so in really after the Pacific shorebird initiative came out, there was immediate discussion about the fact that we really needed to address the mid-continent areas. I remember I was in a meeting in 2017 where we were talking about the fact that we needed to develop a, a framework for the mid-continent. And this coalesced in November of 2019 with a meeting in Panama City, Panama. And if you, you note that timing, that was about the same time that the Rosenberg et al. paper came out. And it was interesting because when we first talked about shorebirds, maybe I'm wrong, but it seemed like if you got away from the people who were really interested in shorebirds, you really didn't hear a whole lot about them. And after that paper came out, it really seems like the urgency and the, and the need to, to really address these horrific declines that it, that it describes um, really increased. And so at this meeting in Panama City, there was general agreement that we needed the strategic conservation plan that it needed to be integrated along the flyway with the ultimate goal to sustain shorebird populations for future generations and also provide ecosystem services that benefit human well-being. So at this meeting um, we agreed to a general geography which includes pretty much the western portion of the breeding area in North America and then the mid-continent area which we divided into three uh, regions which includes the Great Plains, which is the orange on the map on the left, the Great Lakes, Mississippi Valley, which is the purple, and then the Western Gulf Coast of Mexico, which is the green area. And then in South America, it includes all of those interior portions of the continent that are not influenced by the tide, 
because the, the East Coast is covered in the Atlantic Flyway and the West Coast in the Pacific Flyway. So our, our targets for this effort are, the conservation targets are breeding and non-breeding shorebird populations and habitats. And then again, it includes this idea of human well-being elements because as you move forward with trying to do conservation strategies, you have to consider the human element and ensure that um, local communities are still able to get food for their families, have access to clean water, and, and can still um, basically make a living. So as we talked about our conservation targets, we, couldn't, we knew we couldn't include every single shorebird. And so we wanted, um, so we selected focal species that we wanted to be sure captured the range of habitats and geographies within this mid-continent flyway that represents the diversity of shorebirds that relates to other planning efforts. So we in no way were trying to reinvent the wheel. We looked around at other efforts that had already been done and incorporated those where, where it made sense. And we wanted to target populations that are feasible to restore and also those that have high conservation concern. So we ended up with 26 focal species. Um, eight of them are include their breeding and non-breeding habitats in North America. Nine of them have their breeding habitat in North America, their non-breeding in South America, and then another nine that have their breeding and non-breeding habitats in South America. So again, these were the three regions that we focused on in North America, and we developed committees both in North America and in South America, but I'm a member, or I wasn't, well, yeah, I still am a member of the North American Committee, um, and it's it's composed of members from federal and state government agencies, as well as NGOs that represent each of these different regions. And our role is to liaison with partners and stakeholders to assist with workshop development and implementation to provide technical input and then to finalize the workshop products and develop um, the draft North American portion of the framework. So the way in which we got input from partners and others was through a series of workshops. So the first thing that, that we did was develop what's called a situation map. And this is basically an assessment of the situation facing shorebirds right now. And then, um, you know, like all meetings in 2020, we originally were going to have in-person meetings, but given the situation, everything switched to virtual workshops. So our first workshop dealt with, we brought this, the draft situation map to the participants and got their input on it. Um, and then we had a series of workshops for each of the three regions with the West Gulf Coast first and then the Great Plains workshop and then the Mississippi Valley Great Lakes workshop was in January of this past year. So the workshops are pretty cool. They follow a conservation standard process, which if you're interested in what that is, you can, you can find lots of information about it on the internet. Um, but it provided, this was the same sort of framework or process that was followed by the Atlantic and the Pacific. So it ensures that we kind of have a consistent output. Also, because the North, the North American Committee and the South American Committee are developing our draft separately, it ensures that we're using the same lexicon or same language so that as we fold the, the two drafts together, hopefully it's, it's seamless. We developed a workshop website and what was really cool, we had some interactive tools called Mural, which is like a big whiteboard. So not only could we talk to each other, but we could also manipulate the items on the whiteboard and provide our input either by talking about it or in writing. And then we were able to break up into small groups where it was needed. We had Spanish as well as English um, small groups. And then a number of folks participated and helped and made these workshops happen. Jenny Duberstein with the uh, Sonora Joint Venture with the Fish and Wildlife Service, she's really a rock star. She led us through all of this and, and was very vital in the workshop success. And then one of the, you know, if there's a good side to the pandemic, the National Conservation Training Center with the Fish and Wildlife Service couldn't hold in-person training. And so they were available to provide kind of the technical support for these workshops. And, and so all of these um, really contributed to a, to a great, um, great experience, I thought, within the workshops. So this is the situation model. And, you know, I hate it when people give presentations and say, oh, I know this is pretty busy. And I apologize for that, but I, I couldn't see not showing the situation model. So if you look more at the colors, 
on the left are the gold blocks are are the contributing factors in the middle part where the red blocks these were the 17 primary threats that through the workshops were identified as those are the primary threats affecting shorebirds right now and so those gold boxes are what we think contribute to the existence or persistence of those threats and then the green boxes are our conservation targets the shorebirds by each of the three regions so some of those threats apply to all three regions and some apply only to one or two and then the right side of the model is what i talked about earlier with ecosystem services and the human well-being elements and for me, that was a little harder to kind of, you know, the, the stuff on the left is what we're used to dealing with. The stuff on the right was a little more difficult, but it basically forced you to think about what are the ecosystem services provided by the habitats that shorebirds depend on? And how can you tie that to what humans need so that they see the value and the connection with the habitats and the value of protecting those habitats and what they get out of it? So that was a cool addition to this process. And then honestly, it was during this process, initially, we didn't include the, the breeding area, the Arctic Boreal, because there was already a lot of work being done up there, but we, we realized we really needed to include that. So one of the things we identified was incorporating explicitly some of that um, input from the Arctic Boreal region. And then working through these workshops, what we ended up doing was developing results chains, which these are basically a series of if-then statements. And what are the, the benefit of going through this process, although it's difficult and it makes your head hurt, is it chunks up big concepts into small steps. That makes it a little easier to figure out, okay, if we want to start with focusing on farm bill programs and how can we um, ensure that there are practices that benefit shorebird habitat. And then on the far side, it's some increase in habitat. How do you get there? And, and going through this process chunks it up into these smaller pieces that makes it somewhat easier to understand. And so basically it's a series of saying, if we do this, then we expect this to, to, to be the result. And it, and it provides a means to measure whether or not we were successful. And there's a loop in there, um, so it's adaptive. So if it doesn't quite work out the way you thought, then you can circle back and maybe readjust. And it also includes and it embeds the, the objectives. And then the fact that oftentimes in order to get these changes, it, it requires some change in human behavior. So this is kind of where we are now. We've incorporated feedback from the workshops. Um, the, North, the North Committee is basically developing the draft framework now. South America is continuing to do their, their workshops. They ended up doing more workshops in smaller groups. And then there's also work being done to incorporate information from the Arctic and Boreal region. And so we figure in the next couple of months, hopefully by the end of 2021, we'll, we'll have the two drafts from North America and South America that will merge into a hemispheric framework. And then we're looking to be completed um, by April of 2022. There's been some great funding support for this for this project. The Fish and Wildlife Services provided funding, uh, ConocoPhillips and and other entities, and then of course just the passion and input from folks that are willing to to give their time to contribute to the effort um, without any monetary reward, just the fact that they they believe in the project. So just to kind of summarize. Um, the the Mid-Continent Shorebird Conservation Initiative, it's a strategic framework developed through a logical process, collaboratively with partners throughout the, the flyway. It's developed at a scale that matches the life history of our conservation targets, the shorebirds. And, it, and it's focusing on the habitats and people that contribute greatly to the hemispheric populations of, of shorebirds. And so, just to finish up before I leave, one of the other things we've done is created a website that brings together all three initiatives. So if you have any interest in looking at the initiatives and seeing what they cover, you can go to this website and there's a link to each of the three, three initiatives. Um, and with that, I thank you for your time and attention. And I guess if there's any time left for questions, I'd be happy to entertain them. Uh, no questions so far. If anybody 
in the of the attendees do, please use the Q and A icon at the bottom of your Zoom screens to enter a question on it. Um, Doreen, thank you very much. That was another very good presentation on it. I know there were a couple things that jumped out to me. One being the impact that off-leash dogs have on it. Um, yeah, we have. Yeah. Go ahead. I was going to say that was one that came up not only in the Atlantic Flyway, but also in our region, the Great Lakes area in particular. Um, I don't know how many people from the Great Lakes mentioned the impact of unleashed dogs. And that was one that was a surprise to me. But if you think about these birds that nest on, you know, they just have a shallow little indention with their eggs. And if you flush those adults off during the heat of the day, the eggs are done. Um, and then there's also the direct impact of the dogs. If the dog catches the young birds or catches the adults. So, and, and the interesting thing in the Atlantic Flyway is they formed a working group and use social scientists. There's a social scientist that have led the efforts to affect change because again, that's a change in human behavior to recognize the impact of their action and get them to change. So that's been pretty cool. That is neat. And I, you know, I say this as a view from a dog owner, we actually have six adult dogs here at home. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it, just that importance, it's not only about the people around you, which is how we usually think of leash regulations on public properties or in a store. It's making sure your dog doesn't bite somebody else, but there are farther impacts out there from having an off dog leash. So getting people to really embrace responsible ownership is more important than we thought on there. Yep. The second part that I really liked of what the strategic planning is doing is bringing in um, the human side of things. At least in the Nature Conservancy, this has become a bigger and bigger focus over the last decade of it and how we have to work with people, people yeah. in cities, to get people those experiences, to get them to understand how they are impacted day to day by the condition of our natural resources. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, like in South America, too, if you think about some of those ranching operations or some of the traditional ways of life, just thinking about what, I mean, if you're going to get change, you're going to have to get them to buy into it. So, yeah, it there's just no way to separate the human component from, from any of these conservation actions. And I think that's important. You know, like Ethan had mentioned earlier, we can't keep doing what we've always done. We need to, uh, we need to think about how we can make real changes that will benefit the, the species we're trying to ensure can persist beyond us. Indeed, indeed. And Ethan, thank you very much for the, the way you introduced your presentation to of it. I think it laid the framework for that very well. So we're not getting any questions. Thank you again, Doreen, for your presentation. Very you good. You bet, thanks for asking me. You're welcome. Uh, Kara, are you ready? Um, as that's a interesting question. <laughs> I've been catching <laughs> nut hatches until about 10 minutes ago, so. Um, oh man. <laughs> well, let me give you your introduction. Maybe I'll give you a minute to get going. No, no, I've got what I've so everybody, got. So. Okay. Everybody, I'd like to introduce Kara Juice. Jose. Jose on there. Yeah. Kara has over 10 years of experience conducting research on migratory bird population. She has worked in various ecosystems, including the Chihuahuan Desert Shrublands. Eastern Treblins and Forest, and West Mexican Dry Tropical Forest. She earned her Bachelor's of Science in Biology from Northern Illinois University, and then a Master's of Science in Wildlife Sciences from New Mexico State University. Her PhD research at the University of Missouri, Columbia, focused on territory settlement, habitat quality, and demographics of a migratory shrubland, um, shrub, shrubland breeding songbird, the Bell's Vireo. She has also been working with the Bells Varios on their wintering grounds in Jalisco, Mexico since 2009. After receiving her doctorate, she spent a year as a postdoc for the Missouri Ozark Forest Ecosystem Project, known to many of us as MOFEP, where she began investigating 
investigating responses of forest and shrubland and breeding birds to stand level forest structure. She then moved on to a postdoc for the University of Massachusetts Amherst, where her research focused on shrubland breeding birds throughout the Eastern US. Kara grew up in a small town in central Illinois and her, in her spare time, she enjoys travel, birding, hiking, running and watercolor, watercolor painting. So welcome Kara and take it away. Thanks. Um, hi, uh, yeah, I'd like, uh, I said when I started, I've been running around catching nut hatches this week and let me start my timer. So um, this isn't as uh, pulled together as I want, but it's still full of tons of shrubbird things. And so, um, so today basically I wanna talk about like what are shrub birds um, and why do they deserve their own category? And this whole topic, or this is my, my soapbox on this topic, uh, pretty much started back when I was a master's student and I innocently picked a shrubland breeding bird, the sage sparrow, to do full annual. I was really inspired by full annual cycle research from the um, Pete Mara and the Red Starts. And, and I've always wanted to do that type of work. And I was in the wintering grounds and I picked this shrub, little shrub bird, the sage sparrow. And then as I started trying to put that research into the context of existing research, I just came against this huge, the fact that there was like no research on birds that were similar to this and that there's a, a ton of research on, um, particularly in the Eastern forest and birds that are using clear cuts and, and um, shrublands created by silviculture, but that that wasn't directly relatable to all birds that nest and breed in shrublands. And then to top it off, I was doing a wintering bird study and there's just no wintering research hardly at all, especially in the US. And, um, and then just the more that I've worked in, in over the last 15 years, it's and having conversation with shrub birds and just continuing, I went and worked with Bell's Vireos. I didn't mean to do this, it just happened. <laughs> and, and I had the same issue because Bell's Vireos don't have anything to do with forests. They're this bird that exists in this place between grasslands and shrublands and they'll never go into clear cut. So, um, I've just been kind of on a mission to be the advocate for our shrubland birds and an advocate for that they need their own category because right now they're almost always split amongst um, one side of that ecotone from grass to forest. Um, and, and that leads to them falling through the cracks. And so that's one of my um, yeah, cracks in the sidewalk analogy here. And, and so I hope today to convince you that, that a lot of the birds you think of as forest birds are actually shrub birds and um, that the shrub part is more important than the forest part. And that by not looking at them as a group all in one group that we are really missing out on an important trend in fur conservation. And so I always have to remember the controls. Sorry. Okay, come on. So first, can I ask, is this, um, can you read everything? Because the, the video bar is in front of things. Is it blocking the view for anything for you guys? No, everything looks fine to me. Okay. I had that problem on a recorded talk, so I didn't want it to happen. Um, okay, so the main thing behind this session is, 3 billion bird loss. So starting with the data of the Rosenberg et al. paper in Science, Decline of North American Fauna, that described the loss of almost 3 billion birds since the start of the breeding bird survey. And that was the first time people looked at bird loss as a, a number, a whole number instead of percentages and trends. And the way that uh, Rosenberg et al, they categorized their birds, they did it with, um, with avifaunal biomes that are a combination of geography and habitat. And um, shrubland bird, there was no specific shrubland category. I think there, there is an arid shrubland category. Um, but the birds that are not in the air are scattered throughout. 
And so here's some, some rough numbers from the supplementary material from that paper, which I've dug through a lot. And just to, my first step in convincing you that putting all of this rub birds in a category themselves is really important. So if you look at mature closed canopy forests, that's 54 species, 40% of them are declining. And when you look at the mean number loss, that's about 107 million birds lost. Then you go to open canopy woodland, which is a really important um, distinction to, to separate out from forests, which Jane's gonna talk about later. Um, there's 80 species associated with open canopy woodland. And, oh, I'm, I'm actually skipping a step, but I'll finish this. And 60% of those are declining, and that's about 350 million birds. But then you get down to the shrubland birds that are not that, like arid southwest shrubland birds, but those that are um, associated with crosslands and forests and just their own shrub habitats, mesic shrublands, we could say. There's 68 species, 61% are declining, and it's 1.1 billion birds lost. And that's a third of that 3 billion birds, which is actually a little bit less than 3 billion now. So it's approaching half our, um, in the shrubland category. And so where did I get these, these categories? So I'm leading this uh, working group with partners in flight well, actually, I think that's my next slide. Oh, so there you go. 1.1 billion, 137,000 million, six, I can't even say it, it's such a big number, are birds associated with music shrublands, not desert air birds. That's a lot. And you don't see that if those species are categorized and split up amongst all the other habitats. It just washes out this pattern. And so what is a shrubland? What is a shrubland bird? So I've actually been working on this for a while. My postdoc with Dave King, we wrote a, um, a lit review and a meta-analysis that's right now it's an NRCS report. And there's no clear term or definition of shrubland habitat. And in the lit review, um, I found of, there are 107 different terms for shrubland habitat. And so we wanted, the goal of that was to actually try to come up with a true definition of what is a shrubland habitat? What is a single word we should use for it? It's really hard to find a body of literature for a habitat that nobody agrees what it's called. <laughs> is it scrub shrub? Is it shrubland? Is it young forest? Is it, I mean, there's so many. And, but Schlossberg and King in 2007 had already come up with a, a definition, which is that areas with little or no tree canopy with shrubs and saplings within the first two meters above the ground. And so that's what we went with for that literature review. And then shrubland birds were simply species that were primarily associated with habitats that fit within this definition. So in order to find a shrubland bird, you first have to identify what is a shrubland. And, um, and so just to you know, a lot of looking at these pictures here, I'm trying to remember my slides actually, well, I think I'm gonna get into that, but um, a lot of people think that shrublands are just edges and shrub birds are edge birds or um, they use overgrown prairies and they don't really need their own habitat management or that they're just benefiting basically from a lot of anthropogenic activities. Um, but when that's the group that has the largest number of birds lost, then I think we could argue that that assumption is false. And so, um, trying to go into this. Okay, so those habitat, this is a, some, a quick and dirty, some tables from a couple of different projects I've worked on that involve categorizing in shrub birds. And so um, right now I'm working on this Partners in Flight Science Working Group that it's a full annual cycle working group with a goal to increase the amount of science available for full annual cycle conservation planning. And the first thing that we're working on is this database that is defining, that is categorizing the geography and habitat for all breeding North American land birds um, on the breeding and wintering grounds. And so when we look at the habitat, we look at the, the community and the structure. And so the, the, 
the structure categories that define what are shrubland habitats. Again, not arid lands. We have arid habit, arid shrublands are a different thing. And so that number is even bigger if you can also look at, but since we're in Missouri, I'm just focusing on these mesic shrubs. Um, these are the four categories, early serial disturbed forest, this climax shrub, which we actually didn't end up assigning to anybody, um, dense, complex, dense shrubs or complex, complex regenerating shrub, and open sparse old field. It's hard to even make these categories because there's no, nobody agrees on a name <laughs> for any of them. So they get quite descriptive. And so um, these are the categories that I used in, it's this category system that I used to come up with those big numbers, that 1.1 billion bird number if that makes sense. Um, so in the review that I did with Dave King, we, we pulled data out of every paper that we could find across Re Fish and Wildlife Service region three and five that did abundance point counts on birds in those habitats that fit in that shrubland category. And we created this list of shrubland birds for just those two Fish and Wildlife Service regions based on where they were actually reported in the point counts and did a, did a meta-analysis with that data and came up with like grass shrub, shrub and forest shrub species. And so I don't expect you to remember this, but you know, this is, there's a lot of overlap between this list and our list and partners in flight. There's five or six, other, no, there's actually three other reviews and they, even they don't all agree, but this method actually, we use point count data. We used where pe people reported seeing the birds in order to define this instead of doing um, like expert opinion. We actually looked at where the birds were reported. So this was like my first effort into getting birds into a shrubland, trying to come up with a concise list of shrubland birds. Um, and these were the, the habitat, cat, the habitats oops, that, were in those that fell within that shrubland habitat definition in that same review, looking at barrens, glades, regenerating forest, managed forest, um, power line right of ways is a really big deal in the east, um, pine oak savannas, wetlands, there was, well, scrub shrub is just a term that people use for a lot of different things, um, wildlife openings. So again, these are all just different terms for, for a habitat that shares really common, a similar um, structural component. Okay, so I got a little ahead of myself here, but so here's the structure. So for those, going back to those, what was I, 56 species, this is where, <laughs> they were split up almost evenly I can't remember the number off the top of my head. They were split up evenly among this dense complex regenerating shrub, early serial disturbed forest. And what's this like old field, this herbaceous shrub mosaic habitat, something like this. And you know, it's not, it's not all being clustered in, in one grass, grassland side or forest side. Um, these birds were associated with evenly across this, this range of um, shrubland structural categories. And then when you look at the communities, um, they were, the majority of them were within a shrubland community. They weren't just a region, like if you're in, a, if in, this, in this system, if it was conifer forest, you pretty much were um, either a regenerating conifer forest where you were in a really a disturbed forest like a Pitocin or a wetland, someplace, something that prevented those trees from growing to mature heights. Um, and, and the same, whereas deciduous, this is, um, this could be like clear cuts or disturbed deciduous forest, but the majority of species were true shrubland species, not just edge or disturbed forest species. Um, so just trying to show that there's a lot of variation within this, this habitat. And if we weren't looking at these as a shrub category, they would have been split across these five different um, communities instead of being put into their own 
um, category. And now talking about geography, um, so those it was 68 species, and this is again from the Partners in Flight database. Um, this is the geographic distribution of the 68 species. Um, they're largely, well, about half of them are with the, in the east and in the north forest, but not specifically the eastern forest, but just like the eastern half of the United States. And that's because if I included the arid land species, they would clearly be more in the west. But you do have these mesic shrub species in the western United States. It's not just arid dry shrubland species throughout. So again, if you were breaking up this group of 68 birds by forest communities and geography, it just spreads these species out across these all of these different geographies and habitat categories. And it washes out this pattern of 60% of them are declining and a huge number of birds, over a billion birds lost just in this category. So getting into um, Missouri and the central hardwoods. So the central hardwoods, before I even came here, they already had in, in, in our priority bird groups, they have forest, woodland, grassland, and then they have a grass, or we have a grass shrubland group. And so um, I can't say how they're being spread out because we <laughs> always have recognized that in the central hardwoods. But if, if you looked at this list of birds, and this is a group you work with, most of these birds, moving warbler, prairie warbler, painted bunting, um, Buick's friend, vireos, thrashers, sometimes chats, usually towies and orchard oros would all usually be in a forest woodland habitat if you didn't have a specific shrubland category. And some of, and then the rest of them would be in grassland. So they, again, they would be split across, but we recognize we have a huge, just like one of our biggest categories of um, priority, like grass um, habitat associated. <laughs> Our species groups that are associated with habitats is the grass shrubland category. Then getting into Missouri species of conservation concern, um, 30, all the blue arrows show a bird that fell within the shrubland category on in that partners in flight um, database that I've been talking about. And 33% um, of the birds are within that shrubland group. And um, which here, again, it, it clearly falls in here, but here we've called it young forest, woodland and savanna. And um, if you pulled out shrublands, then you would have, well, these are all already priority species, but they're spread out across multiple um, categories again. However, we actually do in Missouri have a category that contains those. And so they're largely clustered, which is great. Is, I think so, <laughs> my soapbox. Um, and then getting into, I tried to look at all of the bird conservation regions in Missouri, but so the upper Mississippi, Great Lakes region, very long JB name. This is their land bird list. And these are all um, oops, shrub birds and they're split across. They do have forest and barrens which a barren would be, a, is a shrubland. And so they've combined those into one category. Um, and then American tree sparrow, and by our definition is a shrubland bird. And, um, and these are actually, I didn't talk about tundra birds. There's actually a lot of shrub birds that breed in the tundra. And that actually is an American tree sparrow is one of those, but then it winters and shrubland, grassy shrubland, shrubby grasslands as well. Um, and so just in summary, just, to just keep beating <laughs> this drum, that just splitting this group of birds across all of these multiple categories really disguises the conservation need of this specific group. And, um, and that by assuming that shrub birds are all edge birds um, will just continue their decline because each species needs these species of specific disturbed habitat or disturbance regimes and also within an appropriate habitat mosaic. So two 
two shrubland birds could have need exactly the same shrub structure, but like a Belgevirio needs these patches of shrubs within a, a grassland mosaic, and you could take those exact same shrubs and put them within a, a forested mosaic or matrix, and you could have um, like a blue growth beak or indigo bunting, and then you get an indigo bunting that just uses it all. And so um, it's just really important that we identify that all these birds, they do have a specific thing and that if you manage for, you can manage for shrubland birds with a similar um, management, <laughs> management tools and, and methods by disturbance, whereas you couldn't do that, you wouldn't manage for forest and trouble at the same time. And with that, I think I pretty much just said all of these things. And so I will open it up to questions. I didn't even practice that. And that was exactly 20 minutes. <laughs> that was good. Thank you. And for me, it kind of harkens back to a comment we made last night with Mark Robbins' keynote speech and that, <laughs> kind of on how we define um, natural communities and um, the functions that occur with those of it. So something that it seems like we've had trouble delineating in the, with this particular is the role that those shrubs play within a system on it. And yeah. how they can... It's Go really, ahead. I mean, it's really hard to put squishy things into square bins, like things always, come out the top, you know, and, and it's, I've been working with a, the partners of Light Working Group. We've been working on this for a couple of years and it's, it's um, you think you can just pick something that already exists, but they don't always fit the needs of what your group is. And we're trying desperately to not reinvent the wheel, but it, um, it it's hard. <laughs> it's hard yes. to do that. Yeah. So here we did get a question through for you. And while I'm asking this, I want to, I rushed things a little bit this morning. I apologize to our three speakers for that. So if anybody in the attendees has a question for any of our speakers, they're both still on. I can ask those now. We have till 1015. So um, Kara, here's a question for you. What are the main takeaways in terms of personal actions to help troubling birds? Personal actions? Um, what do you mean by personal actions, like what we can do in our own property type of personal action? Yeah, so I think this afternoon we're going to be talking a little bit about you know, this, the steps that we as individuals can take. So I think this is getting at that same. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, that all, I mean, planting native shrubs in your property is, is always good. If you, even if you live in town, if you, but if you have a farm or large property, you know, certainly if you just mowed, you know, every other strip of your yard every third year, <laughs> like just let, even if you just, I mean, I know we don't want non-native shrubs, but birds use them, you know, or you could plant, if, I mean, far, I, I think when you, when I drive around farmlands, because my dissertation, I actually was working in wildlife strips in the middle of cornfields and they were full of bells, vireos, and, and chats, and, and kingbirds, and thrashers, and catbirds, and, and, and my bells, vireos did well, and so we just actually let the shrubs grow and stopped mowing everything, and when, for those of us that do have a, a lot of property, um, if all those ditches were sumac and blackberries, like, birds use that, you know, and, and um, but, you know, it's like mowing every three years with a brush hog is harder than mowing, with, you know, once a month. But planting native shrubs in your yard and actually having shrubs instead of just a perfect lawn, birds use that. They winter in it. They, I planted sumac in my yard. Um, we just need more shrubs. I think that they, people really think of it as messy. You know, it's not a tree. People love trees. People don't get as excited about, about shrubs. And so, um, they're, so, you know, they're cheap. They grow fast. You can cut them back. They're pretty aggressive. Um, get those September 1st. You can order your shrub saplings from Missouri Department of Conservation. <laughs> yes, I, I think that's a good answer to that question. You know, especially for me. Well, if you're looking for, you know, aesthetics, while sumac and stuff can get carried away from you, it's still not too hard to control and it's pretty showy in the fall. 
I even like it in the winter when it's holding on to its fruits still. Yeah. I, I cut out a bunch of the honeysuckle and I ordered, I spent 60 bucks on MD, on the, sap, the saplings you get from NBC and planted a hundred of them where I cut out you know, like four giant honeysuckles and hopefully it grows fast enough, but that's just in town, you know, right in Columbia. And so plant shrubs, uh, cut down trees. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Doreen, are you still on? One of our panelists had a question for you. Yes, I am. Okay. Uh, Dana, you want to go ahead and ask? Yeah, thanks. As a panelist, I can't use the Q&A. Um, Doreen, I really appreciated how your presentation broke down what appeared to be a super complex process um, into an understandable format. And I had a question on the slide that had quite a few boxes on it um that was like the framework that came out of the workshop and there was a human dimensions type section and it it said like some of the challenges are you know that people don't really think they can affect change etc and there were a bunch of other things so i was just wondering if you could comment on like how deeply the strategic plan is going to get into that sort of like public outreach um endeavor. yeah yeah thanks dana that's exactly what this is intended to do so the the slide you're talking about is the situation model, which is basically our assessment of the threats that are that or the situation that shorebirds face right now. So the boxes that you were talking about were the contributing factors. So oftentimes it may be laws and policies. It could be people feel like it's not possible to make a change, which is often what we get into when you start talking about climate change. You know, a person individually may think, well, what can I do? to really affect change for that. And so going through that process of trying to think about um, what are the factors that contribute to the threats that exist? And, and you really have to kind of define those before you figure out how to make an effective change. And then from the situation model, once we've gone through that process, the next slide was the one that showed a result chain. And those can be kind of confusing, but those are, the, are really the heart and core heart and soul of kind of the framework because those are the ones where we will define the conservation strategies we think that will result in effective change for the species. So I can give you an example from the Atlantic Flyway. One of the things going into that strategy was, you know, there was always this idea, everybody knew that hunting took place in South America and portions, particularly in the Guyanas in the North uh, East area of South America, but it wasn't really determined to be that big a threat. But as they got into it and they began to work with the collaborators in South America, they figured out this was a pretty, pretty big threat that they needed to address. So they developed a working group and that working group has been working to basically take an unregulated situation and put some sideboards on it. So that all resulted from, you know, you have a results chain where it starts with unregulated hunting and your end result is basically somehow find a way to get control of that hunting and so going through the result chains it's smaller chunks so you say okay if we do this then it will get us this so sorry dan i feel like i'm kind of just rambling now but does that kind of address what what you were asking it it does very much thank you yeah, yeah. No, that's a great example thanks Okay, so that was a good morning session. Uh, I appreciate all three of our speakers joining us.